pleasant good morning to all and welcome to this our second annual health financing conference. My theme this morning is if not now, then when the imperatives for healthcare financing. The presentation will kind of give you a sense of the hospital expenditure profile to date. I will spend some time explaining what we consider to be the drivers of healthcare costs and why the imperatives of healthcare financing today. And then speak a little bit about universal health coverage that we speak a lot about uh, today in our health system. This, gives, this slide gives you a sense of the the value of the Elizabeth Health Budget uh, versus the Ministry of Health Budget. Today, in 2013, the budget was $347 million in the Ministry of Health. And of that, the Elizabeth Hospital consume, or will consume $156 million, about 45% of the budget. When we look at our recurrent expenditure in line with the budget, you clearly see from 2006 to 2013 there's a financing gap. And this story reflects the situation of all health systems of the world. There's no health system I know in which the demand for resources equates to the supply of resources. The, the, the challenge that we have in our health system is how do we narrow the gap as closely as possible given the resources that we have. So this is the this is the this is the this is the challenge that we have here. The blue line gives you an indication of the approved budget, and the red line gives you a sense of what our actual expenditure is. So there's obviously a financing gap that poses the challenge for our health systems. So we refer to it as a structural problem because we say all health systems will face a situation where there's a widening gap or the gap between the demand for and cost of services and the supply of resources. When we investigate the, the, the drivers of demand, what do we see? Increased cost of medical supply, drugs and pharmaceuticals. Obsolescence and advancing technology. And these two drivers of demand are what we call exogenous factors because we are forced to be price takers in this part of the world because we don't manufacture drugs, no uh, medical supplies, no pharmaceuticals. So whatever the market says are the price for these items, we do not have a choice but to accept those prices. The practice of defensive medicine by a physician, the highly litigious environments that we are in now, Doctors are hardly practicing a lot of medicine by the acumen. In Cuba today, because of the, the limited resources that they have, primary care physicians practice medicine based on the acumen. So they could look at you and look at the color of your skin and your eyes and say, go check your kidneys. Because they don't have the technical, the, the, the capital resources as we do have in the West. The issue of malpractice coverage is, of course, linked to the highly stressed market that we're in. Today at the hospital, we spend about $1.7 million per year on malpractice insurance. And it is necessary to ensure, as a board, we mitigate the risk that could happen for unseen circumstances. Inappropriate uh, utilization of our hospital services. High consumer uh, expectations. Persons are watching ER and Dr. House. I will come to A&E and say, I saw this on television and therefore, why can't we have this type of treatment at the hospital? Changing population, demography and population, linked to aging and of course the burdens of the NCDs, inappropriate lengths of stay, the population unresponsiveness to this issue called personal responsibility. We're losing sight of it. If you're diabetic or you have a medical condition, uh, it behoves that you accept responsibility for your care and not expect the caregivers to be responsible for your care. 
inappropriate uh, patient pathway management, and we refer to as the, the lack of seamlessness and movement of patients between one sector and the other, from the hospital to polyclinics, from polyclinics to the private sector. Those pathways have created uh, no end of problems that create what we refer to as a, almost a recycling door where patients are simply being recycled and not being treated in the appropriate setting of care. In turn, just to give you some data in terms of the um, increased use of diagnostic services, you will see here uh, between 2007 and 2012 how the laboratory investigations have increased. Likewise, uh, the diagnostic uh, imaging studies. Our pathology in terms of uh, patient throughput hasn't changed much, but yet we see an escalation in the amount of um, studies being done to treat patients. This is a slide given to us from Accident and Emergency Department. Almost 64% uh, of the patients who present to the Accident and Emergency Department are for, sorry, 28% who present to the Accident and Emergency Department are for non-urgent care that require diagnostics. If those diagnostic facilities or capabilities were the in a different setting, those patients will not have to come to the hospital and consume our resources. Indeed, this is the category of patients that complain about staying at the hospital six and seven and eight hours. When we look at the CARICOM region, this slide gives you a sense of the, the health profile of the region. Uh, you see heart diseases are num uh, is the first uh, leading cause of death followed by cancers and the NCDs to follow. If we compare this slide with what we see here in Barbados, uh, cancers are number one, followed by, sorry. In terms of cancers in Barbados, uh, on the male side, prostate, colon, lung, stomach, and rectum are the top five cancers in male. In the female is breast, colon, cervical, and, and rectum. This information uh, came from the, uh, is from the Barbados National Registry. In terms of prostate cancer, which I found was very, very, very alarming, in 2008, it was found that Barbados was second in the world in terms of the incidence of prostate cancer, and second only to France and Martinique. But look at the mortality rate. We have the highest mortality rate, and that's in 2008, prostate cancer in the world. Very, very serious. A study was done recently by Taylor et al. over a 48 hour period at the Queensland Hospital to look at the, uh, the whole question of diabetes at the hospital. And what the study found that was that in an analysis of 261 beds, 111 of those beds who occupy with patients with diabetes. So 42.5% of the cohort of patients uh, reviewed by charts were diabetics. And it is reflected as the highest documented in the English medical literature, 42.5%. Of the diabetes-related admissions, 89% were related to the active diabetic foot. Length of stay, Sorry. Let's us stay 19 days. And for the most part, these patients lie in a bed with diet, medication, bed rest, for the most part, until the diabetic condition improves and then they discharge. 19 days when we're supposed to be moving towards ambulatory care uh, to minimize occupancy levels. And we have a cohort of patients, 42% spending 19 days on our beds. So it explains when patients come to ENA, &E, all the diagnostics are done, we need to find a medical bed, and the patient remains in ENA &E for sometimes a day or two, waiting for a bed. This is one of the phenomena that is driving the challenge related to bed management. Information from the Barbados National Registry, believe it or not, 
There are 11 heart attacks in Barbados per month. And look at the kind of age profiles that we see. Most of the heart attacks are related to patients with diabetic conditions, 46%. More than half of them are obese and 74% hypertensive. Again, look at the age group. This is a productive workforce that is succumbing to, to heart attacks. The situation is even more grave with strokes. There are 49 strokes per month in Barbados. 49 strokes. Again, the same kind of characteristics of the patients who succumb to strokes. 50% uh, are diabetics, and almost 80% are hypertensive at the hospital. So the NCDs are going to have a significant impact on the cost of our services. The impact is manifest itself in increasing economic, social, and intangible costs. We use a statistic we use called disability adjusted life years, which is the number of years lost as a result of the, the medical condition. Increased length of stay, and of course, the, 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 the impact is going to have on the demand for rehabilitation services. I've just pulled out one area, which is uh, hemodialysis services. In 1979, we had three patients on hemodialysis. Today, we have almost 225 patients on various forms of renal, renal therapy. 176 are managed at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. 36 patients are on home dialysis, and look at the age, 7 to 81. 24 outsourced to a private provider. It is estimated that we will have four new patients per month who are almost ready for hemodialysis services. So in terms of treating this almost, well, 236 patients, these patients alone consume almost $14 million of our budget. $14 million of our budget. Some of my colleagues said to me that this is really a maintenance program because the day we, we discontinue treatment to any one of these patients, the, the, the outcomes will be catastrophic. So we're spending $14 million every year and growing to keep at least 236 patients alive. So this, is, I think, is the shape of things to come. Um, we started this way, and, and this is where this is where we, end, we we are today. I was cautious not to put whether it's Sprite or Coke or lemonade in here, but you you could make your guess on this one. In terms of the, the structural problem on the supply side, and this is the supply of resources, there's a slow going slow growing economy. And we don't expect economies to grow at any enormous rate over the next four or five years. The growth will be sluggish. So we can't reasonably expect that more resources will come to us. So if at all, the resources will remain the same or less, whereas the demand for services will continue to grow. The demand from other sectors. There are times when we sit around with the Ministry of Finance to discuss our budget. And un unless you could demonstrate that uh, how you could contribute to, to uh, the earnings of the country, perhaps you don't get the level of airplay that uh, is expected. Maybe it's one of the things that we have to do better. We have to be able to define how does the health system contribute to GDP. So when we sit around the table with the Minister of Finance, we say, hey, it's not only tourism, but if we don't keep the population healthy, your GDP would suffer. And here we lose at least two or three or four percent. We got to get to that stage where we could begin to speak in that kind of language with our ministers of finances. This was a slide uh, we, I, I took from a presentation done by uh, the senior economists in Republic Bank, just to demonstrate that if if the, if the Prognosis for growth in the region is reflected in this way. We do not expect to see any significant growth uh, in the economy. And by extension, 
one can reasonably expect that the resources to the Queensland Hospital are not likely to increase. This gives you a sense of the expenditure profile today of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. We require at least $190 million to at least sustain the minimum package that we can provide to the people of Barbados. Our salary component is about $9.5 million, which is well within international standards. We're trying to keep the, the payroll component somewhere around 65 to 70%. We believe we should run at about 60%. Drops on medical supply, about 1.7, 1.5 million. Uh, utilities, about $1 million per. And this is per, per month. And other operating expenses relates to debt servicing, uh, stationery, and, and other supplies. So the system requires at least one ninety there about to keep it going. And this doesn't take into consideration the planned replacement of capital uh, um, uh, items as well as keeping the plant in a good state of repair. The part of universal coverage therefore is the, is the sort of mantra that most of our health systems have continued to adopt. Our member states in 2005 reaffirmed their commitment to the concept of universal coverage. And essentially what it says is that all persons, all citizens of a country should have access to a package of services that they need, not want. That they need, not want. And in so doing, they should not incur financial burden. So to you ladies, uh, breast implants and tummy tucks and all those are uh, cosmetic. It's not covered in the package. And to you men in the order, audience, uh, uh, penal enlargement and all of those are not, not part of this package. Not part of this package at all. Alright. So this is the basic tenet behind universal coverage. This is the slide that is popularly used and I will use it, utilize it to, to explain. On this axis, it identifies the population to be covered. So if if this little area here is your coverage mechanism and you need to get to the end, Universal Health Coverage says we now need to extend the level of coverage to cover those that are not covered. On this axis, we have what services are to be provided. And if this is the envelope of services that you now provide, this arrow indicates the extent of services uh, that needs to be provided. And then on the yeah, vertical yeah. axis, we have what, what do people have to pay in out of pocket? And that's the out of pocket expenses. This therefore reflects we need to reduce the amount of out of pocket expenses that the population pays so that we improve access. And that is one of the drawbacks of the Stanley Latin and others we speak to earlier on. Many times we hear this issue about user fees and uh, being toyed around, but user fees is one of, has one of the major drawbacks it has it, that it limits, it limits access to media. So the party universal coverage as adopted by member states, all the governments must therefore answer three fundamental questions. How is such a health system to be financed? How can they protect people from the financial consequences of ill health and paying for health services? This really speaks to equity in access. And then finally, how can they contribute, how can they encourage the optimum use of available resources? The problem has been defined on many, many, many occasions. But I think where we are now, the opportunity presents itself if we embrace it, not fear the future, we can in fact make a difference. It was Einstein who made the point, if, if he was given one hour to save the planet, he would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute to resolve it. He would spend 59 minutes to define the problem and one minute to resolve it. We spent a decade speaking about this issue about healthcare financing. The problem has been well defined, 
But that one minute to make it happen escapes us. Colleagues, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share this insight. Um, before I leave the podium, I'd just like to acknowledge the Minister Innes, who is here with us as the Acting Minister of Health. Welcome, sir, from the busy schedule. And I just want to take the opportunity to introduce our three main speakers today. We have Dr. Carlos Chase, who is the President of the Virus Association of Medical Practitioners, Chase. We have Dr. Stanley Lauter, who is a senior economist in the Health Economic Unit at uh, University of the West Indies, uh, St. Augustine. And we have uh, Mr. Clark, Edward Clark, from, who is the Chief Operation Officer of Surgical. Welcome, sir, and we look forward to your presentation today and to hear from you uh, on ways in which we could really address this question of healthcare financing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. James.